Hello, everybody, and welcome to another lecture in Geography 340, Climatology. I am Zach Hilgendorf, uh, and today's lecture topic, we're going to focus on the structure of the atmosphere. So we're going to start here on this big blue marble that we call Earth. Um, while it seems incredibly big by our standards, let's put that into some context. By sheer radius alone, Earth is 6,370 kilometers. That's just in radius. That's not looking at the surface area of Earth. That's just looking at Earth from the center to the outside. And at the very edge of that radius is this tiny little layer that we call the atmosphere. What is the atmosphere? Well, it is a thin envelope of air surrounding the Earth uh, which is held to Earth by gravity, along with small suspended particulates. So this envelope of gas is roughly 480 kilometers high. Uh, it surrounds the Earth from the surface to an undetermined uh, altitude. So there really is no top to the atmosphere. Um, we say 480 kilometers. Uh, we also say 800 kilometers. It, it, it's kind of a, a gradient. Um, there have been five distinct layers that have been identified using thermal characteristics, chemical composition, movement of air parcels, and density. Uh, we're going to focus on four of them in today's lecture. So each of these layers is bounded by pauses, a tropopause, a mesopause, um, etc. We'll get into some of those in a little bit. Uh, where the maximum changes in thermal characteristics chemical composition, movement, and density occur. Let's start off with the troposphere. This is the one most important to us because it's where we live. It's the lowest layer in the atmosphere, uh, containing 80% of the mass of the atmosphere. So the, tropos the troposphere begins at Earth's surface and extends roughly 6 to 20 kilometers high. Uh, this is also where all the weather occurs. Um, so it's super important to us because that's what this class is about, is about weather uh, and climate. So the height of the troposphere varies from the equator to the poles. At the equator, it's around 18 to 20 kilometers high. By the time you get to 50 degrees north and south latitude, it's only about nine kilometers high. And then by the poles, it's just over six kilometers high. Uh, and then the transition between the troposphere and the layer above it, uh, the stratosphere, is the tropopause. Uh, and together, with the troposphere and the tropopause, that's what we call the lower atmosphere. So this layer is inherently unstable. So what does that mean? Well, because we have so much mixing of warm and cold air parcels, it's inherently unstable. It's turbulent. There's a lot of uh, hot air rising and cold air descending. So we call it inherently unstable because the other uh, layers of the atmosphere don't experience this to the same degree uh, as we do down on our side of the world. So as the gases in this layer decrease with height, the air becomes thinner. So temperature also decreases with height in this layer. So as you climb higher, the temperature drops from about 17 degrees Celsius to negative 51 degrees Celsius. If you want to get an idea what that's like, go stand on the footbridge on a really cold day. And I would warrant that you probably haven't had it that cold. Um, the coldest I ever had while I was a student uh, here at Eau Claire was, I think, 40 degrees below Celsius. Uh, and that was, I, I walked to campus in my ice fishing gear. It was so cold. But that's not even as cold as it gets at the top of the troposphere. So rising air parcels, if we're assuming they're dry, are going to be cooling at the uh, environmental lapse rate, which for dry air parcels is about six and a half degrees Celsius per every kilometer of rise. Uh, as we said, there's strong vertical motion in this. Uh, and so the height in the tropopause or troposphere, pardon me, as we said, is variable. It's actually variable related to the mean tropospheric temperature. That's why as you go from the equator to the poles, you have a decreasing height uh, of your troposphere because there's decreasing temperature. And then the jet stream, the thing that controls most of the dominant weather patterns in a given season for us is located in the upper troposphere as well. 
Once we get above that, we have the stratosphere. This is the second lowest layer. Uh, and oftentimes it's your cruising altitude uh, when you're flying from place to place. Um, ozone is prominent in this layer. And when I say ozone, I don't mean the bad ozone that we are contributing to and emitting in the troposphere. This is good ozone. Um, and the ozone here actually absorbs a lot of the really intense and nasty stuff coming off of the sun and, and really intense solar radiation. So the stratosphere extends from the tropopause up to about 50 kilometers above Earth's surface, and it holds about 19% of the atmosphere's gases, but very little water vapor. Um, you don't get a whole lot of water vapor and, and uh, cloud formation up in the stratosphere. So temperature increases with height, opposite to that of the troposphere, uh, as radiation is increasingly absorbed by oxygen molecule, molecules, which leads to the formation of ozone, as we said. So the temperature rises uh, from an average of about negative 60 degrees Celsius uh, at the tropopause to a maximum of about 15 degrees Celsius at the stratopause due to the absorption of this ultraviolet radiation. Uh, the increasing temperature also makes it a calm layer, unlike the troposphere, uh, with movement of gases being quite slow here. So the regions of the stratosphere and the mesosphere, the layer above it, along with the stratopause and the mesopause, are called the middle atmosphere. So the transition boundary, which separates the stratosphere from the mesosphere, or mesosphere is called the stratopause. The mesosphere, the layer above that, extends from the stratopause to about 85 kilometers above the Earth. Gases, including the oxygen molecules, continue to become thinner with height. As such, the effect of warming by ultraviolet radiation also becomes less and less, leading to decreasing uh, temperature with height. On average, temperature decreases from about negative 15 degrees Celsius uh, to as low as about 120 degrees Celsius at the mesopause. However, the gases in the mesosphere are thick enough to slow down meteorites hurtling into the atmosphere, often leading to them burning up uh, in the mesosphere before they get low enough to potentially harm us. And then finally, we get up to the thermosphere. Uh, thermosphere extends from the mesopause to roughly 690 kilometers above Earth. But as we said, there's no real top to uh, the atmosphere here. So the mesos or the thermosphere and then the exosphere, which is would be above that, um, get really far out uh, off the surface of the planet. So this layer is known as the upper atmosphere. Uh, gases of the thermosphere are increasingly thinner than in the mesosphere. And as such, only the higher energy ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from the sun is absorbed. But because of this absorption, the temperature increases with height and can reach as high as 2000 degrees Celsius near the top of this layer. However, despite the high temperature, uh, the, this layer of the atmosphere would still feel very cold to our skin because of the extremely thin air. There's not a lot of molecules and a lot of energy in that sense, as you would experience down here. So the total amount of energy from the very few molecules in this layer isn't sufficient enough to heat our skin. So it'd still be pretty dang cold to us. So now let's move on to mass. What is mass? Well, mass refers to the amount uh, of matter an object contains. It depends on what type of atoms the object is made of and how many atoms there are. It's traditionally measured in kilograms. So if you measured out a kilogram of steel and a kilogram of feathers, you'd have the same mass of each object, a kilogram, but their volumes would differ significantly. Uh, mass does not change by varying an object's shape, size, or location. So the mass of Earth's atmosphere is greater than five times 10 to the 18th power kilograms. Seems massive, right? Pun intended. Uh, <laughs> weight, on the other hand, is a measurement of the gravitational force of an object. It's related to the object's mass and the object's location. This means that weight is really just a function of the amount of force applied on an object. My mass, whether on the moon, earth, 
or Jupiter, it's always gonna be 75 kilograms. My weight, however, is going to vary as a function of the gravitational force applied on me by those different bodies. My mass may be 75 kilograms on Earth, but my weight's typically described as 167 pounds. On the moon, however, I only weigh about 28 pounds versus Jupiter where I weigh 422 pounds. So the weight of the atmosphere itself is five times 10 to the 19th power newtons. What is a newton, you may ask? Well, a newton is a unit of force. It's defined as one kilogram per meter per second squared. It's named after Sir Isaac Newton, who all of you should have heard about by this point in your education. But if you haven't, Newton was an English mathematician and physicist, among many other things, a true Renaissance man, if you will, who lived in the 16 to 1700s. One of his most famous legacies are his laws of motion. A Newton of force is named after his second law of motion, which says that the acceleration of an object depends on the mass of the object and the amount of force applied. So a force then is equal to a change in momentum, which is a function of mass times velocity for a change in time. Simply put, force is equal to an object's mass times acceleration. You'll often see this expressed as F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. So then to take this a step further, we like to think of force normalized over a given area. The weight of the atmosphere divided by the surface area of Earth then equals 101,325 newtons per meter squared. So pressure is just a unit that describes the force or weight of an object applied over a given area. We like to use units like pascals or millibars to describe that pressure. So the average atmospheric pressure in pascals is still 101,325 pascals. They're comparable, uh, basically, and you can convert newtons to pascals. So let's talk about air pressure. So the atoms and molecules that make up the various layers in the atmosphere, despite their tiny size, actually exert some weight on us. We feel this weight as pressure. So air pressure is simply, as we've said, the weight of air above an object. So the weight of air is directly related to the number of air molecules in a given volume. So air pressure depends on the number of air molecules in a given volume above an object and how fast those molecules are moving. So from the sea level or from sea level to the top of the atmosphere, the weight of all molecules above each square inch or square centimeter, I, we could do two, but in this case we'll do inches, uh, is about 14.7 pounds per square inch. That's a lot of weight considering it's just molecules. However, it's a lot of molecules. Near sea level, a box with a volume of one cubic inch contains around 400 sextillion air molecules. That's four followed by 20, or 400 followed by 21 zeros. And kind of an intangible number. Then as the elevation increases, the number of air molecules decreases with the weight of air. Therefore, it's less, meaning a decrease in air pressure. In fact, while the atmosphere extends more than 400 some odd kilometers above our heads, one half of the air molecules in the entire atmosphere are contained within the first 5.6 kilometers of the atmosphere, well within the troposphere. Because of this decrease in pressure with height, makes it very hard to compare the air pressure at one location to another, especially when the elevations of each site differ. Therefore, to give meaning to pressure values observed at each station, we actually need to convert that station uh, air pressure reading to a common uh, level. We will use sea level to do that. So all across the entire world, all pressure stations or all pressure readings are converted to what that pressure would be at sea level. Two most common units we use to describe that type of pressure, especially in the United States, is you'll often see Hg or uh, inches of mercury or millibars. So inches of mercury refers to the height of a column of mercury measured in hundredths of inches because we're in the US and we do weird measurements like that. Uh, millibars, on the other hand, comes from the original term for pressure, bar, Bar is from uh, the Greek word baros, meaning weight. 
So a millibar is one one thousandth of a bar. That is the amount of force it takes to move an object weighing a gram one centimeter in one second. The millibar values are used uh, in meteorology in range oftentimes from 100 to uh, 1050. At sea level, standard air pressure in millibars is roughly 1013.25 millibars. And oftentimes in weather maps and things you'll see throughout the course, you're going to see them expressed in terms of millibars. And as we said, density decreases with altitude. So the density at sea level, the density of a, a parcel of air, on average is going to be 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. That does vary marginally with temperature uh, and some other factors. I guess purity of the air would be one of them. But assume, if you're doing equations like this, assume it's going to be 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed. Once you get up to 10 kilometers with uh, altitude in the atmosphere, it's only it'll drop down to 0.413 kilograms per meter cubed. And then by the time you get to 20 kilometers, it drops down to 0 0.088 kilograms per meter cubed. So you can just see and get an idea for how that density changes. And then pressure also changes uh, with altitude at roughly an exponential uh, decay fashion. So if we're at 50,000 meters or 50 kilometers up into the atmosphere, uh, if we were to move down to uh, 1500 and we're following this, or sorry, 15,000, and we're following this exponential trend line, we're gonna drop off really rapidly uh, in, in terms of pressure or increase in our pressure. So with altitude, with a sharp decrease in altitude, we see a sharp increase in pressure. So from the sea level to one kilometer above the surface, uh, we actually drop roughly one or 0.114 millibars per meter or 1.14 millibars per 10 meters. However, by the time you move up to the difference between 10 kilometers and 11 kilometers, uh, you're actually dropping at a much lower rate. So 0 0.038 millibars per meter or 0.38 millibars per 10 meter change. Uh, so you can see just how rapidly that changes within an 11 kilometer stretch. So now let's get physical here. Uh, we're going to first talk about the ideal gas law. So air is an ideal gas. Um, it's composed of several gases, N2O2, argon being some of the primary ones, which are very well mixed within the troposphere and variable. Uh, there are other extremely important quantities of other gases, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and ozone. Water vapor in particular can have a pretty profound effect on the behavior of air, notably when it condenses to form clouds. So for now, we're going to assume uh, and discuss dry air. Um, instead of wet air because there are different change rates for those. So the ideal gas law says that pressure is equal to density times the gas constant times temperature. Pressure is measured in pascals, or which is also equal to newtons per meter squared. Density is measured in kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, R, the gas constant, is 287 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And then temperature, is measured in Kelvin. So a common mistake is for us to use the wrong units in this formula. And that's not helped by the fact that we have about four different ways to say, you know, the pressure at sea level <laughs> and four different units to accompany that. Um, so this is natively in Pascal's. So you want to make sure you default to Pascal's if you're going to be trying to use the ideal gas law. Now we move to the barometric uh, formula for the troposphere. This is applicable for altitudes less than or equal to about 44,000 meters. So local weather and climate effects also affect the exact barometric pressure at a given point, um, but we're gonna assume that it isn't in this case. We're assuming a dry and standard parcel of air. So there we have, uh, 
P is equal to P naught, that, that subscript zero is referred to as uh, naught. So P is equal to P naught times one minus L H over T naught to the power of G times M over R times L. It's, a whole, it's alphabet soup. What does it mean? P is the atmospheric pressure at a given altitude in Pascals. That's what we're trying to find. If you're, you know, five kilometers up, that's the altitude you're going for. And we're trying to solve for the atmospheric pressure at that altitude. P naught is the standard pressure, I have abbreviated as SP, at sea level, also in Pascals. L is the temperature lapse rate. So here, 0 0.0065 kelvins per meter. Uh, H is the altitude in meters. So if you're at five kilometers, obviously you're at 5,000 uh, meters. T naught is the standard temperature, ST at sea level, roughly 288.15 kelvins. Uh, G is simply the uh, Earth's gravitational acceleration or 9.81 meters per second squared. Uh, M is the molar mass of dry air. And then R is the universal gas constant. All put all those together and input uh, or do some some quick fun algebra, and you can really start to determine uh, what your pressure would be at a given altitude. We're not going to dive that far into the weeds here. Um, we're going to do some simpler uh, comparisons, but that just gives you an idea. If you needed to and you were curious about how to do it, that's how you would calculate. Uh, your pressure at a given altitude, assuming a few different things. So what's the pressure at sea level? We already said this one. It's 101,325 uh, newtons per meter squared, or 101,325 pascals, or 1.013.25 or millibars, or 1,013.25 hectopascals. We use way too many <laughs> different uh, different units for this, um, but it does come in handy in some cases. But just know and be very cognizant of what units you're looking at and if you need to do any conversions. Uh, notice that there are two orders of magnitude different between millibars and pascals. That could really mess up an equation if you do that the wrong way. So the pressure at sea level, 1,013.25 millibars, at 100% the pressure of the atmosphere. What if we move up to 53%? Well, in a very simple way, if we know that it's 100 or 1,013.25 millibars, we can just multiply this by 0.53 and get our uh, pressure at five kilometers, which is a roughly 540 millibars of pressure. And then if we move up and we get to roughly 10 kilometers, we're only experiencing about 26% of the atmospheric pressure. And what is it there? Well, take 1,013.25 millibars times 0.26, and you get roughly 264 millibars, give or take. Then if we move up to 15, we're only at 12% of the atmospheric pressure. Or 120 millibars. And if we move all the way up to 20 kilometers, say, for this example, what about 55 millibars? So, with that, to recap, in this video, we talked about what mass and weight are. Uh, we talked about the weight and mass of the atmosphere, uh, the ideal gas law and the barometric pressure formula, and then how density and pressure and temperature uh, vary throughout these different, these four primary layers within the atmosphere. So the troposphere, the stratosphere, the mesosphere, and the thermosphere. Um, the next uh, lecture that we're gonna do is gonna focus on the composition of the atmosphere. So we've got physical in this one, we're gonna get chemical in the next one. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out uh, and I will see you all in the next video. Enjoy, thanks.